with all the chaos going on between Russia, Ukraine, China, US, has anybody ever wondered what India's position in any of this is actually? Because believe it or not, they don't have the best relationship with China and that's going to affect future affairs, which is going to have a direct impact on the US. So if you're scared about the future, this is probably the most important story, frankly. Sources description box below. This is going to be one long podcast, I believe podcast number four, and it's going to be separated into four small videos. Hello, real quick. My name is Zach Moss. I just got my master's studying these very things. So I want to talk about it with you guys. Subjects today I want to talk about is first of all, I'm going to go into specific statements by the countries themselves in their own papers. A lot of times when we hear about international affairs, we hear from it from American media outlets and we don't actually hear from the countries themselves. So I'm going to go into first China helping Pakistan get a nuclear power plant on India's border, which by the way, Obama said is one of his greatest fears and it's essentially coming true right now. Number two, we're going to get into China's statements about their their conceptions of U.S. and India relations, which have absolutely pissed them off because the U.S. is now sending India weapons and all sorts of other fun stuff. And then I'm going to kind of get into the crux of why India and China are not in the best relationship and how this affects the U.S. So all of this, listen, if you're going to listen to any videos, okay, it's probably going to be this one because this is going to be more significant, I would argue, than the other ones that you probably would ever see in the YouTube sphere. Okay, so let's get right into it. So this is from the Hindu. By the way, I'm looking off my phone here. I don't really like doing this, but I'm moving. I film all these like back to back to back days. Okay, so this is by the Hindu, which is India's paper itself. So here's, I'm gonna read you a quote. Quote, China Inc's deal with Pakistan to set up nuclear power plant in Punjab province. By the way, that is on the border with India. Another quote, China on June 20th inked an agreement worth a whopping 4.8 billion dollars with cash strapped Pakistan <laughs> to set up a 1,200 megawatt nuclear power plant as a sign of increasing strategic cooperation between the two all weather allies. Okay, first things first, let's just go ahead and appreciate the little shade that India likes to throw Pakistan's way. The cash strap, that's not the first time, by the way, they use that term cash strapped. But anyway, so $4.8 billion for a nuclear power plant. Guys, listen, that is a extremely problematic situation. Why you might add? Well, because there's been 3,092 deaths on the border between India and Pakistan. India has nuclear weapons. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Building a nuclear power plant on the border between India and Pakistan on the Punjab province probably is not the best way to solidify any sort of good relations between India and Pakistan. Now, listen. This very situation, President Obama had said during his presidency that he lost sleep out of all the issues in the world over the potential for World War III breaking out between Pakistan and India. So we're all concerned all the time with Russia and Ukraine and what the U.S. is going to do, rightfully so. And I'm not diminishing that by any stretch of the imagination. But listen, this is a literal uh, violent interactions between the two countries. Now, it's considered state-based violence. So it's very hard to figure out whether that's that's Pakistan government to the Indian government, which is also, which is, by the way, that is the case. But then also that's militants uh, who represent loosely the Pakistan government fighting with Indian forces, etc. It's all kind of mixed in as long as one of the governments is involved. That's where this comes from. Okay, so two nuclear power, power countries, powered countries, Countries with nuclear weapons both fighting each other. There's violent skirmishes and China's making it worse. Well, wow, that's really bad. Okay, what could possibly go worse? Okay, so there's a guy named Abdul Qadir Khan. And I apologize, probably butchered the name here. Bear with me. He's otherwise known as A.Q. Khan. Now, this is a guy who's considered to be kind of the grandfather of the Pakistani nuclear weapons. Listen, a little side tangent with this guy, but fascinating story. So he's a guy who was educated, I believe, off the top of my head in the UK. Now, he actually, not only did he help Pakistan build their nuclear weapons back, I believe, in the 70s, but he's also the reason why North Korea has nuclear weapons itself. So homeboy here just essentially sold the secrets to everybody. Fascinating story. So what do we do with this information? Well, there's not really much we can do at the moment other than... Let's be very careful with what our leaders in the U.S. are saying about the situation because it is a hotbed for a potential war that very well might rope us into a proxy war with China. So let's keep that in mind. China, you're playing with fire right here, homeboy. I'll get into with the future stories about why China is doing this. Okay, so second story was my time here. I'm looking at my camera. Okay, good on the time. Story number two here. 
I'm going to tell you a story. This is by China Daily, which is a Chinese government communist owned paper. I like reading it sometimes. They always throw shade against the US all the time, but it's better to know what people who don't like you are saying than just ignore what they're saying altogether. So I'm trying to diversify the media sources so people have a better understanding of what's actually being said internationally without it being regurgitated by our own media. Essentially, the story today is about China being absolutely pissed off with India-US relations. It's significantly worse than you think. It has to do with selling weapons and India's scared about what China's doing right now and they're trying to arm themselves, all sorts of stuff. So bear with me here. I'm gonna read you a quote. First of all, the title of this story. <laughs> By the way, I'm not laughing because I think the situation's funny. I laugh when, when the writers of these stories decide to throw in just little bits of shade. Little, little, little trinkles of emotion in this, and it's, it's sponsored by the government. And just the pure pettiness of it all, I just find it kind of funny. Okay, so here's the title of the story. U.S.'s plan to rope in India to serve Washington's purpose, wishful thinking. Okay, kind of a weird title, but all right, let's read it. Here's a quote. The U.S.'s intention to rope in India to counter China and Russia and even further intensify the regional tensions towards militarization and conflict is only Washington's own wishful thinking, analysts said on Sunday. Okay, so first things first, are they wrong on this? I mean, look, <laughs> gotta call a spade a spade. They're not really wrong on this. The U.S. is trying to pull India closer to their side. And look, I'm going to get into it just a second here they are kind of receptive towards it. India is to some degree accepting what the US wants in some degree because it's also somewhat beneficial for India. Now, let me show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you what China says is the motives behind India and the motives behind the US. So it's India, it's, excuse me, China's perception on what other countries' perceptions are. And this is where, th this is what I'm trying to add as a YouTube channel to you guys to give everybody different perceptions of what's going on. Okay, here's a quote. On the one hand, India has strengthened cooperation with the US and the West, especially in defense and security. But on the other hand, it has explicitly refused to join the US-led NATO. Now, I'm not gonna read you everything in the article because it eventually it gets a little dry, but essentially their idea is that India is trying to play both sides. They're trying to, on the one hand, not really abide by, say, the US and the Western interests, but also capitalize their returns on military technology and the like. That's completely true. I mean, look, hey, they're just spitting facts. I'm not obviously a fan of their government and everything that they do, but I mean, if you're if you're calling strikes and fouls, I mean, that is pretty accurate. It's pretty accurate. Okay, now here's what they say about the US and their intentions, and this is where things get a little juicy. Quote, separately, Blinken began meetings in Beijing on Sunday, just days ahead of Modi's arrival in Washington on June 22nd, wishing to manage the escalation to ensure that the world's two biggest military powers do not, quote, veer into conflict. Sullivan, which is the, the national security advisor to Biden, Sullivan was quoted as saying in the separate routers report on Friday, the discretionary between the U.S.'s stated position and its actual actions can be attributed to the fact that one of the key focuses of U.S.-India cooperation is to contain and exert pressure on China, experts had noted. Okay, so their conception is that the U.S. is interested in containing China, completely correct, and India is capitalizing that on their own personal gain, that's completely correct. So look, I mean, they are right, but what is the crux of the, dis the grievance between India and China? That's a really big question. What specifically is the biggest issue that they all have with each other? How, what started all of this? That's what I'm trying to say, aside from the Russian war. Well, I'm gonna read you one more, one more article, or I might just make this a separate video in of itself. So why does China and India not really get along the best, whereas Russia and China kind of are? Okay, so I'm gonna read you this from Routers. Quote, India approves purchase of military equipment worth $8.5 billion. Another quote. India on Thursday approved purchases of missiles, helicopters, artillery guns, and electronic warfare systems worth $8.5 billion as it sought to add more teeth to its military. Third quote, the focus of the Navy, which accounted for approvals worth 560 billion rupees on Thursday, comes after India expressed concern last year over Chinese activity in the Indian Ocean. Last quote, the list of purchases approved include 200 additional Brahmas missiles, 50 utility helicopters, and electronic warfare systems for the Navy. Okay, so this is where we get into the, the deepest, the grittiest detail of all the relations between India and China and the US and what's going to shape the international affairs. So the US had this jolly idea. Let's sell weapons to 
India. Now, keep in mind, India used to be a little salty towards the U.S. And the reason why they're doing that, because India's rival, Pakistan, the U.S. worked with Pakistan to leverage operations in Afghanistan. It was kind of a logistical center. Well, since the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan, we switched sides and we started siding with India. So India's getting weapons. India's concerned about the movement of China. China's pissed off and it has something called the Belt Road Initiative. So it has economic initiatives that's doing in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So the U.S. left Pakistan, Afghanistan. China's filling in that void. So now there's an opposition between India slowly siding with the U.S. and China slowly siding with the other countries. China's interested in these other countries not only because they're salty towards India, but also because their Belt Road Initiative, China builds a lot of things. Developing countries need a lot of things to help them develop their own country. This is a way that hegemony is created in the 21st century. So back in the old days, this is now I'm getting more of the academic side, hegemony in the old days used to be military conquest. Now it's more economic conquest and China is kind of embodying that approach. So overall, China's really mad about all of this and they're siding and building nuclear power plants and so on in Pakistan. And so why is any of this significant to the U.S.? Well, first of all, this is going to create a potential World War III that we could very well avoid. It's very important to understand these things because if our leaders, for example, misstep and might say a thing or two that might piss off China, or we might, you might see a little bit more relationships in India, for example, the U.S. trying to pull India into the Security Council as a permanent position in order to try to rail and bring in China into the system without creating their own separate systems. For example, the SWIFT banking system, but that's a separate subject. So we might start to see these types of movements play. And what I'm trying to do right now is highlight that these things are in motion for you guys right now. So we are all aware that this exists. So if there is a situation where we might get into some issues in the future, we could spot, hey, Look at that. We're getting closer to war. Perhaps we should stop doing the things that we are seeing at this moment. So beware. These things are in motion and these are going to affect us for generations. India is a very big country in developing and we're going to run into some issues. The very last story that I want to get in today, it's, it's kind of, this, this one's random. I might make this into a complete separate video as well. So, have you guys ever learned or thought or heard about the, the drug epidemic going on in Afghanistan after the U.S. withdrew forces? We all have an understanding that obviously opium is a big deal. Afghanistan produces 80% of the opium. So what has gone on after the U.S. have withdrawn? What is the deal with that? This is significant. The U.S. obviously has a drug epidemic. A lot of that comes from Afghanistan. Heroin, etc. comes from opium and Afghanistan produces 80% of the opium. So let's understand what's going on in Afghanistan. Understand how this is going to affect the drug epidemic going on the US. Very wordy. I think you guys get the point. If this is a new video, sources in the description box below, or if I just add this into the previous podcast, we'll see. Okay, so this has international and humanitarian implications is what I'm really trying to say here. Now, I'm going to read you, first of all, I'm going to read you this. This is from Al Jazeera. Read you this article, and then I'm going to get into the very depth of the situation. This is kind of a taking off point for me. According to the Taliban, 4 million people are addicted to drugs, though some local folks, sorry, this is my side commentary. Some local folks say it's more like a third. The, the quote unquote drug users think it's anecdotally probably more of a third of the country. So 4 million people out of a 4D million people population, I would not believe the Taliban in any way, shape or form, but that is significant because 4 million people of the Taliban saying that, it's probably way, way, way worse of a situation. This is where we get into some bad stuff. Did you know? 61% majority, strong majority, 61% of the Afghanistan economy is reliant on agriculture. 61. Of that 61%, the majority, 29% of agriculture is reliant on opium. 29%. Around 2007, the U.S. had this idea of combating opium because that will combat the Taliban because they, they used opium for money, not realizing that Karzai administration themselves got in trouble for trafficking opium themselves. So that is an issue that affected everybody, not just the Taliban. Since the US tried to combat this, US tried to create other crops, such as pomegranates, everything failed abysmally. The Taliban has a historically is against the use of, or the creation of, of opium, yet they can't really do anything about it. 
Why am I mentioning this? Well, because one of the situations that we're presented with is the fact that opium is used to support families as a result of the fact that the United Nations and the international community, especially the US, has withdrawn aid that is being used, that was used in Afghanistan. They said because of the treatment of women. They're not going to give the Taliban money. Well, here's the thing. Who's affected the most from a drug epidemic if you're thinking in terms of poverty? Is it going to be in a, in a and I don't mean a social justice term, if we're talking about a patri patriarchal society, do you think the men are going to be trashed first or do you think poverty is going to affect the women first? The women usually receive the brunt of the situation in countries like this. So if we're caring about the treatment of women, do you think the head of the Taliban, they're going to be affected most by the, the cutting of aid or do you think they're going to eat and be fully fed? Well, I mean, hey, based off the aesthetics of some of these folks, I'm not making any fat shaming jokes, but if we're looking at the way that they're built in comparison to the people, they're probably going to be fine. The sanctions, though, are probably going to hurt the average person. Probably the women who, you know, while we're concerned about going to them going to school, which is incredibly important, it might not be as important to them as, say, eating. So what is my point here? Perhaps it would be a good idea to increase aid back to Afghanistan so they could rely less on opium, just by example.